A theoretical physicist, C. N. Young, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1957. Among a host of other contributions to his field, his work with Robert Mills resulted in Young-Mills theory, considered the basis of modern physics. He has crossed paths with the other great minds in his field, Einstein and Fermi, Oppenheimer and Teller. Here at Stony Brook, the Institute for Theoretical Physics, which he directed for 33 years, now bears his name. Dr. Young, thanks very much for taking the time. I'm very happy to be here. You grew up uh, in China, the son of a mathematics professor. Yes. Can you tell us a little about your early life? I was born in central China, but uh, I grew up in Beijing. Uh, so my primary school years and uh, four years of uh, high school were in Beijing. And in 1937, I was uh, 15 years old. Uh, the Sino-Japanese War started, and uh, my family moved to southwestern China, to a city called uh, Kunming, which is uh, famous as the end of the Burma Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to college there. In 1945, uh, I was 23. Uh, I won a scholarship to come to the United States. Uh, so I came arriving uh, on November the 24th uh, in New York City uh, because at that time there were no commercial traffic between China and the U.S. And uh, the only way for me to come from Kunming in southwestern China to the U.S. was to fly to Calcutta, India, and there wait for a boat, a ship one of those uh, troop transport ships of uh, the American military forces, which were used to transport uh, over a million American soldiers in the China-Burma-India theater from that area to the United States. So I waited for two months in Calcutta for a berth on one of those uh, troop transports. And uh, the ship was about 5,000 tons. And we went through the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean, where we got into a storm. And I remembered I was vomiting so much. And I said to myself, maybe this trip is not worth it. Uh, but anyway, I arrived uh, in New York and uh, went to Chicago and became a graduate student at the University of Chicago. That was quite, a, quite an adventure for a young man. Uh, yes, it was. And uh, of course, uh, to come to the United States uh, from a completely different culture was, uh, I wouldn't say it was a shock, but it was, uh, it required some adjustment. W was it your, um, your knowledge of physics that got you, um, that sort of bridged that, that divide? Uh, uh, yes, I had a very good uh, education, both uh, in college in Kunming and later for two years in the same university as a graduate student earning a master's degree. Um, my level of education in China was uh, very advanced. Uh, such things like uh, quantum mechanics, I've studied uh, thoroughly in China. So when I got to the University of Chicago, which was, uh, which had uh, at that time the world's best uh, physics department, uh, I found that the, the quantum mechanics course offered in Chicago was not as uh, deep, really? no, nor as uh, detailed as the course I had in China. So I had a head start in some sense. And uh, so I earned a PhD degree in Chicago in 1948. I was thinking that um, when you made your journey to the United States, it was at about that time that the United States had dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes. How did that, how did that affect you, if at all, in your, in your field and as a person? Uh, oh, it has a profound effect. Uh, you know, uh, China was fighting the Japanese uh, invasion from 37 to 45, uh, eight years. 
and um, uh, China was very weak at that time, and uh, it was a miserable time, and the Japanese uh, were very brutal. You may have heard of this uh, massacre in Nanjing. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and nobody had any inkling that uh, there was this uh, new weapon developed in the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, I understand most of the people in the U.S. didn't know about it either. Right. And so the morning in August, when the bomb was dropped, uh, when the radio announced the news, uh, it was a great elation for the people in China uh, because uh, everybody knew uh, that's the end of the misery of the eight years of uh, war. Uh, I remember uh, I was, uh, I came out of uh, our house, rented house, and got onto the street and uh, suddenly I saw many people uh, exploding firecrackers. Uh, you know, in the Chinese uh, custom, if you have something to celebrate, uh, you, you have uh, hundreds of uh, firecrackers. And uh, then I got hold of a newspaper and then realized uh, what happened. Uh, of course, uh, that was a great event for the American people, uh, but I would say the American people did not suffer as much during the war right. as the Chinese people. And as a consequence of that, the happiness and the elation that was felt in China was uh, proportionally higher. Did you understand the physics ramifications of, of the atomic bomb at that time? Uh, the general physics uh, uh, principle that uh, one can generate tremendous amounts of energy by uh, neutron collisions uh, was known since uh, 38 and 39. And uh, that, in fact, even got into textbooks. But the uh, the detailed uh, procedure by which you can uh, do that was a very complicated uh, engineering process. And uh, uh, you probably know that uh, it was so difficult uh, that the Germans in about 1944 or 43 decided uh, it uh, cannot be done during that war. So they abandoned that project. Uh, fortunately, they did. Uh, and in, in the United States, it was uh, picked up uh, first because of uh, a letter Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt, right. uh, but uh, more because of uh, the fear among the American government and the phys physicists especially uh, that the Germans might uh, get it first. So they devoted uh, a wholehearted effort at Los Alamos to do this. Uh, it's uh, a most important event, of course, uh, not only for the 20th century. It's uh, one of the great events in the history of mankind. You I, and I certainly don't wish to to uh, make this all about the bomb, but it's uh, it, it's it's. Uh, sort of coincidental that you went to Chicago, the university where much of this work was done. Um, and uh, one of your mentors there was Fermi, I believe? Yes. Tell me a little about Fermi. Uh, Enrico Fermi was born in, two, in one, 1901 in Italy. Uh, at that time, Italian physics was not so great. And he was a precocious uh, young man, and he alone uh, lifted Ital the level of Italian physics to world standards at a very young age. Uh, he was a remarkable person. Um, I had uh, said that uh, Fermi was a person with both feet on the ground. How so? Uh, in the sense that um, he was very solid. He looks like he was a solid person, and he is. Uh, when he uh, speculates on something, you know that uh, it was based already 
on concrete thought, which he had already uh, been thinking about. Therefore, his uh, words carry authority, because you know that these are not the random uh, or off the top of one's head kind of uh, remarks. Uh, and he was a great theorist, as well as well as a great uh, make experimentalist. You know, in early centuries, uh, many great physicists were both theoretical and experimental. But by the 20th century, uh, theoretical physics has gotten so complicated, experimental physics has gotten so complicated, so very few people could do both. And uh, Enrico Fermi was the last great physicist who contributed first-class work to both sides. How was your relationship with him? Oh, very close. Uh, you see, when I got to Chicago, uh, very rapidly, everybody found that the, this young man from China uh, was extremely well-trained. Uh, so I had a very close uh, and warm uh, relationship with uh, Fermi. Uh, Mrs. Fermi, uh, the Fermis had two kids, and uh, one of them, the older one, Nella, was uh, college age. So the Fermis always uh, hold a square dance party in their house, and uh, I was there many times and got to know the family uh, very well. Uh, in later on, in 1949, uh, Fermi and I wrote a paper together. Uh, it's called Our Meson Elementary Particles. And I was very happy to see that that paper is still referred to today, because uh, we were the first to publish a paper saying that uh, what is known as a pion uh, may be a bound state of a uh, nucleon with an anti-nucleon. These are probably two technical terms, but anyway, uh, we wrote a paper together, and uh, so I was uh, one of the favorite students of uh, Fermi in Chicago. You, of course, knew uh, Oppenheimer. You were at the Institute for Advanced Study with Oppenheimer. Yes. Tell me about your relationship with him. Uh, everybody knows that uh, Oppenheimer became very famous uh, because of his uh, uh, direction of the atomic bomb project uh, during the war. And in 1957, uh, 47, he accepted the, the directorship of the Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, in 1949, he came to Chicago to give a talk about a new uh, development in physics called uh, renormalization. I will not uh, explain what that is. But anyway, uh, that was the hottest uh, topic ar around that time. So I was uh, fascinated by his talk. And I knew that uh, starting that fall, the fall of 1949, uh, there'll be many uh, experts on renormalization uh, at his institute in Princeton. So I applied to become a postdoc at uh, Princeton. And uh, Oppenheimer accepted me. So starting in 49, the four, uh, I went to the institute for advanced studies. I was originally just going to be there for one year uh, as a postdoc and return to Chicago. But uh, I remained and altogether, I was in Princeton for 70 years, from 1949 to 1966. And uh, as you know, the Institute for Advanced Studies was a well-known ivory tower uh, in the best sense of the word. Uh, their scholars uh, do their research uh, without uh, being bothered by committee work without being bothered by graduate students. And indeed, I took a great advantage of that. Uh, that was the period, that 17 years, was the period when I did my best uh, research work. 
I, I understood that um, Oppenheimer tried to uh, convince you to replace him when he left the Institute, but that instead you came here to Stony Brook, which was barely, uh, barely peeking out of the ground at the time. What, what, what happened there? Uh, yes, uh, what happened was the following. In 1965, uh, uh, first, before President Kennedy was uh, assassinated, uh, he named uh, Oppenheimer as uh, the next uh, Enrico Fermi Prize winner. The Enrico Fermi Prize was a presidential award. It was originally awarded to Fermi because uh, Fermi was dying and they quickly created this prize and gave it to him before he died in 1954. And afterwards, uh, many distinguished uh, people who contributed to uh, the U.S. Uh, wartime scientific work uh, got the uh, prize, including Beta, including Teller, uh, etc. And uh, probably, or very likely, because uh, President Kennedy wanted to uh, erase the uh, sorrows that the, the U.S. meted out to Oppenheimer in the Oppenheimer hearings of 1954. So he decided to give, it, give the next one in 62 to Oppenheimer. But before that transpired, he was assassinated. Uh, Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. So then Johnson became president. And uh, in fact, uh, the rumors were that uh, many of the people who were against Oppenheimer uh, tried to convince Johnson not to mm -hmm. give that award. But uh, Johnson did not listen to them. So there was a ceremony, uh, and uh, Oppenheimer did win the award. So that was, uh, I think it was 1963 or 64. But anyway, uh, that was at the time. So by 1965, uh, Oppenheimer had just uh, had this uh, uh, great event of the United States uh, government essentially saying implicitly, we are sorry, right. and uh, we apologize. Now, Oppenheimer, as the director of the Institute, had great difficulties with uh, the mathematicians in the Institute. Uh, that's a long story. I'll not bother you with the details. He was the director, uh, but the mathematics group, which is the strongest uh, at the Institute at that time, and still today, uh, were unhappy with him. Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, they were wrong in accusing uh, Oppenheimer of uh, not favoring mathematics. But anyway, they made Oppenheimer's life very difficult for many years. So one day in 65, I remember Oppenheimer dropped by my office and said, uh, Frank, uh, I'm thinking of uh, retiring as director. How do you think about it? I was uh, surprised, uh, but I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, uh, I think this is a good decision. Because I said, uh, you have been at the Institute for a long time now, and this is the right moment because A, uh, there is a law in the opposition on the part of the mathematicians against you. And uh, in the heat of uh, great debate, uh, it's difficult for you to say, I want to retire. And secondly, uh, the United States government has essentially apologized to you. Uh, this is the right moment. So he thanked me for my opinion. And then he said, uh, I want to propose you as my successor. My instinctive reaction immediately was that uh, I don't want to, uh, to do it because uh, I'm not an administrative type. It's, uh, 
so I told him, uh, I'm honored that uh, you thought so, but uh, I'll think about it uh, for a few min for a few days. So I uh, thought about it and uh, eventually I wrote him a letter uh, saying that uh, uh, while I am not sure I'll be a good director, I'm however very sure that I won't enjoy the life of being a director. So that's the end of that part of the story. But just around that time, a little bit uh, before my final decision, but after he had mentioned his proposal to me, uh, John To, who had just become, who had just been nominated as the president of uh, Studebaum, uh, came to visit me and asked me to join him in Stonebrook to develop uh, Stonebrook into a uh, great research university. Uh, so uh, when I wrote that letter to Oppenheimer, uh, I had already decided with my family that uh, I'm going to move to Stonebrook. That was in 65. And you came on the, pretty much on the promise that a great research institution would be built here because there was none at the time. Yes. Uh, you, of course, know that um, Stonebrook uh, began fift about 50 years ago, uh, but it was uh, in another campus. And uh, the real expansion started uh, when it moved here. And the great expansion started when John Toll came in 65 and 66. And uh, that was a great period of uh, expansion. And I think uh, what you see today uh, have all, in many senses, originated with the few beginning uh, steps that uh, John Tor and his uh, administration uh, put in place. And that you helped him with? Uh, yes, in some respects. You knew also uh, Einstein? Uh, yes, I went to the institute, as I told you, in 1949. Uh, he was uh, 70 years old at that time, and he had just retired. But uh, he lived uh, close to the institute, and he would uh, still walk to the institute uh, every day. He, he didn't drive, and uh, he would walk uh, to his office and then stay a few hours and then walk back. Now, uh, at that time, uh, Einstein's uh, position in physics was uh, towering. It's, uh, I had said uh, repeatedly that uh, Newton and Einstein are the two greatest physicists uh, of all times. And, uh, but uh, he was, at that time, no longer working on the things that we were, we young people were interested in. So we didn't uh, so much uh, bother him. Uh, however, I did hear uh, two lectures by him, and uh, in 1951, I think, uh, I think it's 51 or 52, uh, he sent his assistant, uh, Brewery Kaufman, uh, to me and said, uh, you just published a paper in the Physical Review uh, about uh, gas liquid, uh, how gas became a liquid, how uh, upon cooling. And uh, Professor Einstein would like uh, to talk with you about that, that paper. Wow. So I went to see him, and uh, we must have spent an hour and a half together. And I was uh, very much awed by his uh, presence. Uh, I didn't get very much out of that uh, conversation. I only remembered uh, he repeatedly drew a curve, which was very famous due to Maxwell, a great uh, physicist of the 19th century. And uh, indeed, uh, Einstein's, uh, Einstein was deeply in the tradition 
of old physics, of classical physics, two branches of that, uh, statistical physics and uh, electrodynamics, were his uh, great uh, force. And uh, using this tradition, using his uh, deep perception in these two areas, he launched uh, two and a half revolutions for physics mm. in the 20th century. Two and a half? Yes. Which was the half? Uh, quantum mechanics. Okay. The three revolutions were, that's generally accepted as uh, the greatest uh, revolution in physics uh, after Newton. It was the special relativity, uh, general relativity, and quantum mechanics. Uh, special and general relativity were invented by him, mm -hmm. uh, essentially alone. Quantum mechanics uh, was the work of uh, many people, and uh, so I count that as half a revolution okay. by Einstein. I, I, I'm unable to plumb the depths of physics or scale the heights of physics, mm -hmm. whichever it is, uh, but I wonder if you could explain to us non-physicists, um, the uh, Yang-Mills theory? Uh, you know, what the fundamental physics is about is uh, to ask uh, how matter uh, is put together. In the 19th century, finally, people realized that uh, everything is made of uh, atoms and molecules. In the 20th century, we learned that uh, uh, molecules are made of atoms, atoms are made of uh, protons and electrons and uh, neutrons, uh, but uh, what are protons and neutrons made of? Now we know they are made of uh, quarks. So uh, that is one aspect of what we do. Namely, we want to take uh, matter apart and look at the constituents. But there's another part of the endeavor, uh, namely how these uh, parts are put together. The reason that they are uh, together is because there's a force between them. Force is in daily language. In physics, uh, we call it uh, interaction. So the question is, what are the interaction between these constituents? Uh, Interaction of force uh, is well known already since uh, Newton's time. There's gravitational force. And uh, through the 19th century, we know there are electric and magnetic forces. In the 20th century, we know there are two additional kinds of forces. They are called nuclear forces, which are responsible for the atomic bomb. Nuclear forces. Uh, nuclear forces and the uh, weak forces which are responsible for such things like radioactivity. So there are now four uh, types of forces. The question is, what are the precise nature of these uh, four types? Uh, we know that the uh, gravity through Newton is a inverse square law. You probably learned that in high school physics. So you might say that the basic uh, question, that uh, one of the basic questions, one of the fundamental basic questions we face is how are these three other forces structured? They are not inverse square laws, but what are they? And that's where the young mirrors theory or gauge theory comes in. A gauge theory gives a principle which uh, uh, governed how these forces are structured mathematically, precisely. And uh, when Mills, well, originally in 1918 and 1919, stimulated by Einstein, Hermann Weyer, a great mathematician, uh, proposed what is called gauge theory. Uh, he used that to describe uh, electricity and magnetism, and that was successful. But it does not apply to the other two, the nuclear forces and weak forces. Mm -hmm. And what Mills and I did was 
we generalized what the vial did. And that becomes a general principle of forces, of why they are these forces, including gravity. And that principle is now called the gauge principle. Mm -hmm. And the gauge principle's detailed mathematical structure is what uh, we wrote down in 1954. At the time that we wrote it down, uh, nobody believed uh, uh, that was, it was important. And we didn't know it was that important. But we said that uh, this is a beautiful idea. And the mathematical structure is very elegant. So we published a paper about it. And uh, then 20 years later, various experiments show that that, in fact, was approximately the right direction. Then after struggling for another five years, it became clear that it's not just uh, approximately right, it is exactly right. So that uh, became uh, something which uh, uh, is now the universally accepted principle of how these forces are formed. 1954. Yes. How do you feel about that? The fact that 50 years later, something that you created, that you propounded, has been so so fundamentally uh, has, has so fundamentally changed uh, your field. Well, of course, I feel good about it, uh, uh, but uh, I tell my students that uh, the structure of uh, uh, everything uh, oftentimes has uh, hidden uh, beauty in it. If you can sense vaguely some of this beauty, uh, do not let go. Uh, the reason that uh, in 1954, uh, Mills and I were able to do it as I told you, it was not in agreement with experiment, and nobody believed us. But we saw the beauty of the structure, mm -hmm. so we wrote it down. The elegance of uh, the structure. That's right. It's, uh, it's, uh, oh, by the way, I should add the following. Uh, and that has something to do with Stony Brook. Uh, okay, this uh, Young Mills theory was uh, published, and uh, gradually, Originally, people didn't believe it. Gradually, more and more people see the beauty of it, so people began to work on it. But it was only in the 70s that it was confirmed by experiment. And uh, so by the uh, 60s, there were not many papers, but I would say every year there will be 10 papers, 20 papers about it. And uh, I came to Stony in 1966. And one day, it must be 68 or 69, I was giving a talk, I was giving a lecture. No, I was giving a course on general relativity. It's a graduate uh, course. And I wrote down on the blackboard uh, one long formula, a famous formula called uh, the Riemann tensor. Uh, Riemann was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 19th century. And the uh, Riemann tensor has something to do with uh, Einstein's gravity theory. So I copied down on the blackboard this, pa this uh, long, pa uh, long formula of the Riemann tensor. As I was copying down, it suddenly flashed through my mind that the structure of this uh, Riemann equation is very similar to the equation that Mills and I had written down. Uh, when we wrote it down in 1954, we didn't notice, uh, we were not uh, doing general relativity, so we didn't notice there was any similarity. But uh, that, uh, like during that lecture, I found that they were very similar. So after the class, I went to my office and checked in detail. And sure enough, they were not just similar, they were exactly the same if you define some quantities correctly. So I was a bit excited, but I didn't understand it. And uh, so I went to see Jim Simons. Jim Simons, as you know, was the young department chairman of mathematics at Stony Brook. And he was a great uh, geometer. Uh, so he knew uh, Riemannian geometry very well. 
So I went to his office. Uh, we were still in that uh, old uh, red brick building, mm -hmm. uh, both his office and mine. So I said, Jim, uh, uh, here's the uh, Rivonim formula that you are very acquainted, uh, very familiar with. And uh, some years ago, Mills and I wrote this formula. Look, they are s very similar. And uh, he thought about it for a while. He said, that, yes, yes, that's not strange. They are both fiber bundles. So I said, uh, what's a fiber bundle? Uh, so he gave me a book uh, written by a famous uh, Princeton mathematician called uh, Stinrod. It's called uh, Fiber Bundles. So I went back with the book, and, uh, but the book was impossible to, for me to understand. Uh, the mathematicians have a tendency to write very dry, uh, very abrupt statements. They are precise, but uh, there is no flesh to it. So it's very difficult to, it's all bones, and it's, uh, it's impossible to understand. So I didn't understand. So I went back to Jim and said, uh, look, uh, this book is useless <laughs> uh, for physicists, but uh, we want to understand what this uh, fiber bundle business is about. And uh, could you explain to me what it is? He said the uh, fiber bundles is a new thing in mathematics too, uh, but earlier than in physics. Uh, in starting in the 40s, there were already many papers in mathematics in fiber bundles, and it's now an important branch of geometry. And so I said, uh, could you give us some lectures uh, understandable to theoretical physicists? He said yes. So he gave uh, a series of luncheon lectures, uh, very uh, informal. There may be uh, 10 of us uh, faculty and graduate students of uh, the Institute of Theoretical Physics here at Stony Brook. And uh, as he must have uh, talked for about a, a whole month, and that was very useful for us. So at the end of that, um, we decided to give him a gift for this uh, uh, series of lectures. So we chipped money together and decided uh, to buy something for him. And I went to Irving Craw, a mathematician whom I knew very well. I said, Irving, we want to give uh, Jim a gift. What should we buy? He said, uh, Jim cannot uh, spell give him a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so we bought a big dictionary <laughs> and gave it to Jim and uh, he told me recently that he's still using it. <laughs> but uh, what we learned from Jim in those uh, lectures were very important, not only for me, not only for Stonebrook, but in fact it launched a new trend and that came about this way. After I understood the gist of uh, what the mathematicians were doing with fiber bundles, I realized indeed both general relativity of Einstein mm -hmm. and uh, gauge theory were fiber bundles. So I wrote a paper with T.T. Wu of Harvard immediately after that in which we, we explain in detail the, the relationship between the mathematicians' ideas and terminology and the physicists' ideas and terminology. And so we made a little dictionary. Uh, the little dictionary had only maybe uh, 15 entries. On the left side are the physicists' terminology. On the right side are the mathematicians' terminology. And there was an exact correspondence. So we called it a dictionary. But there's one item which uh, physicists used uh, repeatedly. Its technical term is called source. Source actually was due to, the idea of source was due to ampere. You, you know the electric uh, current, uh, three amperes, five amperes? Yes. That was named after the great French physicist 19th century physics ampere. 
and uh, uh, now in physics, Ampere's idea of a source was a crucial concept. So we have to have that in our dictionary on the physics part. But on the mathematics part, I went to ask Jim, what do you call this? He said, we don't deal with uh, this concept. So we left that the blank. So it's a dictionary with maybe 15 entries on one side, 14 entries on the other side. And nothing to correspond to source. Yes. But then uh, uh, E.C. Singer from MIT, a distinguished mathematician, came to visit. I had uh, known him, so I gave him a copy of uh, our preprint. And he looked at it, and there was this blank. So he thought about it and decided that is a very interesting concept, and they should deal with it. They, they somehow, uh, in their 20 or 30 years of dealing with uh, fiber bundles, had never touched on this idea. So he went to England immediately, and he was a great collaborator of uh, a, uh, perhaps the greatest mathematician today in Great Britain, uh, Michael Atia. Uh, it's now Sir Michael Atia. At that time, he was not a Sir yet. And uh, so they looked at it and found that this uh, concept that they never used, but we dealt with since Ampere, was uh, most interesting. That became now a new branch of mathematics. So they wrote a paper. And because of the prestige and the fame of Atiyah and Singer, many young mathematicians all uh, began to look into this. And now it is a thriving branch of uh, modern mathematics. What do they call it? Uh, well, there are many names. Uh, in particular, a student of uh, Atiyah called uh, Donaldson uh, did the uh, pioneering work in it. So it's called the uh, Donaldson theory. But the, 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 the all those are related to that blank spot. So in some sense, you know, in the first half of the 20th century, physics and the mathematics were divorced. Uh, in early centuries, physics and the mathematics were in close collaboration. But in the first uh, half of uh, the 20th century, the mathematicians became more and more abstract. <coughs> they, in fact, uh, were very happy that they, in fact, uh, one of them wrote an article saying that the greatest contribution, the greatest uh, achievement of 20th century mathematics was that it finally liberated itself from the shackles of physics. <laughs> that was uh, by a famous uh, mathematician. But uh, with this uh, fiber bundle business, uh, the mathematicians and the physicists are now coming together again. So if you want to say, how did the, that coming together come about? I would say that uh, it has uh, something to do with uh, me and Jim and that blank spot in that dictionary and uh, with the Stony Book. So we are very happy that uh, Jim continued to be interested in physics and math. And you know now he's a billionaire. And uh, he just announced he would give uh, $25 million to Stony yes. Book. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, you have, this is just another way you have made connections in, in your life. Uh, not only connections uh, having to do with matter, but also yes. uh, yeah, yeah. interdisciplinary connections as well. Uh, I moved back. My former wife uh, passed away in 2003. I moved back to Beijing. Uh, when I was growing up in Beijing, as I told you before, my father was a professor at the Tsinghua University in Beijing, uh, one of the most uh, prestigious universities in China. And so I grew up on that uh, Tsinghua campus. Uh, in, 19, in 2003, after my uh, former wife uh, passed away, I moved back to that campus. And now I'm a professor of physics on that campus. And uh, Jim and uh, Marilyn came to visit us in 2001. 
That's uh, before my uh, I moved back. I was uh, already visiting that campus uh, very frequently, and Jim came, and uh, I remembered uh, what happened precisely. After his visit, I came back and he came back, and I visited him in, in his office here in Sitokit. I said, uh, what's your impression of China? Oh, he said uh, he was very happy with the visit. He said, uh, I figured uh, the greatest problem in the world today is poverty. And here I see 1.3 billion people pulling themselves uh, out of poverty uh, by their own bootstraps. That's a great contribution, not only to themselves, but to the world. So they deserve uh, our help. What do you need? So I said, uh, uh, we have many visitors in Beijing, but the housing was lousy. Uh, how about uh, helping us to have some uh, visitors housing? So he gave a million dollars. And now uh, that uh, complex, uh, prices are still cheap in China. So that uh, one billion dollars, uh, sorry, one million dollars mm. uh, is suffi sufficient to have uh, nine very nice uh, apartments built. And it's called uh, Chen Simon's Hall. Because uh, one of his great contributions to math and physics was a paper he wrote with Chern uh, in the 1970s. And uh, he and Marilyn recently went to uh, Beijing and uh, opened that hall. So I think that uh, through the math-physics connection, uh, there is now a Stone Book Tsinghua connection too. Okay. I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned that when you came to the University of Chicago from China, you were, you actually already knew some of the things that they were teaching at the time. You were very well trained. How do you, uh, how do you see the, uh, the differences in education in the, in, the, in the United States and in China today? That's a very important question, and I've been reflecting on that. Uh, I think there are very fundamental differences, and uh, these uh, fundamental differences uh, show up on each side uh, good points and bad points. Uh, you know that the, the newspaper said that the President Bush just uh, appointed a uh, committee to study how to address the problem of uh, mathematics education in the primary and secondary schools in the United States. Why? Because uh, in many, many uh, high school student mathematics examinations, international examinations, uh, with maybe 30 nations, the US always is near the bottom. It's the Asian countries that are at the top. So of course, that uh, gets uh, uh, the educators and the mathematicians worried here, and that's why this uh, appointment. Uh, why? Why is it that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, high school education in mathematics uh, is not as good? It's because the whole education and philosophy and system are different. Uh, the kids here are uh, are more treated as uh, adults, even though they were young. In China, if you have a eight-year-old uh, child and say you should do homework, uh, he or she would just go to do the homework. Here, if you have an eight or nine-year-old child, and if you say you should do homework, he or she would say, I don't want to do it. Why not? It's uninteresting. It's boring. The concept 
that doing homework might be boring. It does not exist in China. So <laughs> if you ask a child to do it, he would just do it. Is this a matter of discipline or something? Uh, uh, yes, it's a discipline <coughs> uh, which is in the air. So that the, the concept that, that, uh, that a child would only do something that he or she is interested in does not uh, exist. So that, that's the difference. Now the consequence of that is that the kids are well trained. They do lots of uh, mathematics exercises. OK, so that means the Chinese system is good? No, because uh, if you go to China, they're all discussing. This Chinese system is no good. All the kids are trained too much. A, they have no free time, and they cannot develop uh, other interests. B, they have the tendency to become robot-like. They don't think for themselves. So they are discussing ad infinitum how to change that system to be more like the American system. So after you have uh, observed both these two, you realize that it's a very complicated thing. It's in fact, if President Bush asks me what this mathematics committee can do, I would tell him they won't be able to do anything. Because it's uh, not the educational system. It's the whole society. It's the whole value judgment. It's the whole idea of how uh, you educate. The philosophy behind education is different. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, in fact, I believe that all that one can do on each side is to make small changes so as to most of the kids here uh, are not uh, interested in mathematics. I would say uh, that's OK. Th there's no reason for so many kids to be interested in mathematics. But the system must be such that for those who could be interested, who could in fact be extremely interested, you must uh, provide the opportunity for them to get into it. On the other hand, in China, I would say that don't train all these uh, kids all the time. Uh, it, it's too strict. Lighten up. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so the, I think a comparison of uh, the educational system, the educational philosophy in the Orient and in the United States is a very interesting and very deep subject. Given all that you've said, why would a why would a, a student in China come to Stony Brook to study? Oh, <coughs> mostly because graduate school in the United States is uh, the best in the world today. We were talking about in the last few minutes about the primary and secondary right. schools. When it comes to graduate education, the the U.S. The best U.S. Uh, graduate schools are absolutely the best uh, in the world. So uh, I always say that uh, if you have a bright uh, child, the best thing is for him to get a good high school education in China, a college education in China, and get a good graduate education in the United States. I myself benefited exactly from that. I had a very good college education in China, where the professors are very devoted. They are very responsible. They lead you through difficult things, uh, going to great depths and uh, covering large areas. That's why when I came to Chicago, I had a tremendous advantage uh, compared with my fellow American graduate students. Uh, but on the other hand, when I came to Chicago, I learned how to explore the frontiers, how to uh, be creative in your thinking about the frontiers uh, problems. So I got the best of uh, both worlds. And I think that is, I was fortunate, and I would recommend that to any uh, young person who especially is interested in the sciences. 
I think this is a good note to, uh, to turn it over to our audience and, uh, and find out if there are questions uh, in the audience. Uh, if you'd step up to the microphone if you have a question for Dr. Yang. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, as time went on, experimental and theoretical physics uh, grew apart because of growing complexities within each of them. I'm curious how you uh, yourself decided which, which one to go into, or did it just sort of happen naturally with the work you were doing? Experimental versus theoretical physics? Yes, how did, how did... How they grew apart, and how did you adapt to that? Uh, no, how, how did he actually decide to go into theoretical physics? How did you, why did you decide to go into the theoretical branch? Uh, as I said, experimental and theoretical physics have both become so complex by the mid-20th century. Uh, it's uh, almost impossible uh, to be an uh, expert in bo both. And as I said, the Fermi was the last physicist who made first-rate contributions to both sides. Now, I myself, when I came uh, to the United States, I knew that I had a very good uh, grounding in theory. I also knew that uh, I had uh, almost no knowledge in experimental physics. So I said I must uh, broaden my educational basis so I decided I should write an experimental thesis here. And uh, so I worked, in fact, at Chicago for some 18 or 20 mon months in the laboratory of uh, Professor Allison. Allison was uh, making a, uh, at that time, a large accelerator. It's about the size of this room. Uh, it's a, 400 uh, kilovolt Cockroach Wharton circuit. And uh, so he had maybe five or six graduate students, and I became one of them. But quickly I learned that uh, I'm no good at uh, experimental physics. Uh, when things go wrong, I do not know why they are wrong. And uh, I of also oftentimes uh, turn the wrong knob and uh, do some uh, very bad things <laughs> to various things. So my fellow graduate students were all a little bit uh, worried when I get close to any equipment. Uh, but uh, we were on good terms because uh, I could solve theoretical problems for them very easily. Uh, but anyway, after 18 or 20 months of work, uh, I was very frustrated because uh, uh, Allison gave me a problem, and uh, the experiment I was doing on that problem was not uh, going well. And uh, one day, Teller came. I had uh, been in contact with Teller in theory, and Teller said, uh, I understand your experiment is not doing well. Uh, I said, right. He said, why do you stick to experiment? You had already written a paper, a short paper, uh, in theory, uh, I can sponsor that uh, as your thesis if you make it a little bit longer. So I said, uh, thank you very much. I have to think about this because it was uh, not according to my plans for so long. Thinking about it for a few days, I finally went back to him and said, uh, I accept your uh, suggestion. And uh, that was... Uh, a very important uh, thing in my life, namely to learn what I'm good for, what I'm not good for. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Because both of Stony Brook and Tsinghua University are very great university in the world, and as a professor, I have taught all of the students in both universities, and uh, how could you, ex how could you compare the students in both of the university, one is in America and uh, another is in China. Thank you. Comparing the, uh, the students in China at the college level with the students in yes. America at the, at the college level? Yes, I mean undergraduate. In undergraduate? Yeah. Yes. How would you compare undergraduate? You spoke of... Uh, that's a very important uh, topic, uh, especially since uh, I have some first-hand uh, observation. Um, I taught twice 
in Sonneborg, freshman physics. And I taught uh, for one semester in 2004, uh, freshman physics at Tsinghua University. So I have a first-hand knowledge about the uh, freshman students in physics here and in Beijing. Uh, uh, Tsinghua, of course, is uh, uh, one of the most difficult to get into universities in China. And uh, so I found that uh, there are two differences. The difference number one is that the students in uh, Tsinghua are almost all very well trained. They did lots of exercises in high school. So such things like uh, analytic geometry or trigonometry is no, no problems for them. Here, uh, at least half of my students here were not well trained in analytic geometry or trigonometry. They know the definitions, but uh, they cannot manipulate because they didn't do enough exercises. So the first difference is that the, the high school training in China is uh, much more rigorous than here. The second difference is that the, the students in China, in Tsinghua University, were very mature and very motivated. They were, they knew they have to work hard. They sort of uh, appreciate uh, that uh, what they want to do and they go full force at it. For the Stony Brook students, I would say that at least half of them were still sort of uh, wandering around uh, without any specific aim in life. This is, uh, I've thought about this. This is um, again a product of the difference of uh, the two societies. Now you cannot say which one is necessarily better. The Chinese system is better in training a lot of uh, people who would uh, uh, mature, who would uh, get channeled into some uh, way, of, way of life which would make them uh, useful citizens. But uh, the American system uh, is more free. And so therefore, uh, the people's outlook on life, on everything, is, uh, uh, is less restrictive. And uh, the best of them are given enough opportunity so that they can prosper. Look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates is able alone to create uh, trillions of dollars, not, for, not only for uh, his company, for the whole world. So th that kind of uh, uh, innovative spirit, of free spirit, is the kind of things that the United States educational system and society is uh, good at fostering. And that's, uh, that's true all over the world. I think the Europeans, the Japanese, all marvel at the great success of the United States system, which produced uh, all these uh, uh, tremendous innovations and, as a consequence, wealth. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, professor, uh, you said uh, to sense the beauty is important in the scientific research. Uh, I want to ask uh, whether you have uh, any tricks to sense the beauty. Can you tell us some? You said it, the importance of sensing the beauty or the, the elegance uh, in scientific uh, work. Do you have any tricks uh, that help you to, uh, to spot the beauty or the, the elegance? Uh, the, the direct answer is certainly no. Uh, I think for a young person, it is uh, important, and that uh, the American system is uh, good, good for this, 
to allow uh, oneself to be interested in, in quite a number of things and uh, to perceive some things, some areas, uh, some directions that he or she is particularly interested in. And uh, if a person at a young age could uh, latch onto something that he or she is interested in and uh, fully develop that, that may be the way he or she would find the elegance, the beauty, the usefulness of some things. Uh, it's, uh, the Chinese system is not good for this. The Chinese system has too much of a tendency to impose what the children, what the school, what the society want the young person to look at and uh, discourage him or her to branch out. The American system is better in this respect. So it's, uh, uh, I think there are good aspects and bad aspects of uh, each system uh, when you choose a, uh, to discuss different directions of uh, what you want to push. Dr. Yang, thank you very much. Thank you.